Okay. Oh, thanks, Jonathan. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, so really glad to be here. Today, I'm going to talk about some phenomena that may be a consequence of nonlinear evolution of alpha waves in neutron star magnetospheres. Uh, so this will be some work that I have been doing recently with uh, Andrew Bell-Bordoff, Alex Chen, Yuri Levin, Ashley Bransgrove, Sasha Filipov, and Xin Yu Li here at CETA. So uh, a few of the activities of neutron stars are uh, probably triggered by star quakes. One example is X-ray bursts from magnetars. Uh, as we know, magnetars are neutron stars with very strong magnetic field. Uh, their surface field can reach about 10 to 14 or 10 to 15 Gauss. And one of their uh, most common activity is a short X-ray burst lasting for about a few milliseconds up to a few seconds. Uh, so these X-ray bursts can have a luminosity in the range of 10 to 36 up to 10 to 43 orgs per second. Uh, so the typical uh, scenario for the magnetar X-ray burst is this classic picture by Thompson and Duncan, 1995. So the basic picture is that the neutron stars, uh, because their strong magnetic field uh, evolution, can cause excessive stress in the crust, and this can cause star quakes. So the star quake can uh, produce these shear waves in the crust, and these can launch often waves in the magnetosphere of the neutron star. Uh, these often waves will then dissipate and produce the X-ray bursts. So besides the magnetar X-ray bursts, another kind of phenomenon also involves star quakes. Uh, it's the glitch in pulsars. Basically, it's a sudden change in the spin rate of the pulsars. Uh, this could also affect uh, the radio emission in the magnetosphere. So in all these cases, uh, the way the uh, crust activity couples to the magnetosphere is by launching often waves. So often waves is basically a, a wave that is supported by the tension of the magnetic field lines, and they basically propagate along the magnetic field lines. So the quick launched often wave uh, that goes into the magnetosphere usually have a frequency above one kilohertz, uh, meaning that the wavelength is less than 30 stellar radius, and they could have a wide range of energy scales. So these often waves uh, can have a few very interesting nonlinear effects that could lead to interesting observational features. So today I will talk about three examples as shown below. Uh, I will start with the case where often wave nonlinear break out from the magnetosphere. We think this could be a possible mechanism to produce the fast radio bursts from this galactic magnetar. Uh, as we know, uh, fast radio bursts uh, are uh, millisecond duration, uh, very bright radio bursts of cosmological origin. Uh, so these are still a mysterious phenomenon. So right now, although with the operation of Chime telescope and other telescopes, we are detecting more and more fast radio bursts, but it's still not clear to us like what is the nature of these fast radio bursts. Uh, last year, we got very lucky that we detected fast radio bursts from a galactic magnetar. Uh, uh, this is the name of the magnetar. It's SGR 1935-2154. So here, uh, shown in this picture, is the signal detected by the CHIME telescope. So you can see two radio bursts separated by 30 milliseconds. Um, the total energy involved in the radio burst is probably about 10 to 35 Earths. Uh, interestingly, so uh, concurrent with these radio bursts, it is found that the magnetar also produced an X-ray burst. So this is the observed X-ray burst. Uh, this is the light curve um, from the integral telescope. And you can see that this X-ray burst lasted for about 0.5 seconds. And within the burst, there are quite a few spikes, especially these two spikes 
seems to be coincident with the two radio bursts as shown by the orange line here. Uh, so the total energy in this X-ray burst is about 10 to the 40 ergs. Uh, so there is much more energy in the X-ray burst than the radio burst. So this discovery basically demonstrated that indeed magnetars can produce fast radio bursts. Now, a natural question is how do magnetars produce these fast radio bursts? Uh, so far in the literature, there are two main classes of models for fast radio bursts from magnetars. Uh, the first class of model, uh, for example, assumes that the emission comes from the inner magnetosphere of the magnetar. Uh, so for this scenario, uh, a detailed emission mechanism still needs to be worked out. Another class of model instead uh, proposes that the fast radio burst comes from far away from the neutron star. So basically the magnetar could launch some relativistic ejecta and then this ejecta run into the surrounding medium uh, that produce uh, a shock. And at the shock front, um, there could be this mechanism called the synchrotron maser process that produces the fast radio burst. So if we take this mechanism uh, as an example, so in order for the, uh, a shock to be formed, you need a relativistic ejecta. So the basic theory before was that uh, it's really the kind of like giant flares from the magnetar that can produce this kind of ejecta. So for the galactic magnetar fast radio burst event, we know that the energy involved is not on the level of the giant flares. It's only like very modest. It's the kind of X-ray burst that uh, with an energy range of 10 to 40 orgs. So can this kind of low energy burst event also produce an ejecta? So that's the question we are trying to answer in what follows. So um, we find that in fact, uh, this is actually possible. So the magnetar quake could launch often waves. Uh, for example, the initial magnitude of the often wave may be small uh, with an energy of 10 to 40 orgs. The initial delta B over B, the perturbation magnetic field over the background magnetic field is probably only five times 10 to minus four. However, as the alpha wave propagates out along the dipole field lines, the wave relative amplitude grows with radius uh, as R to the three halves. So at some point, the wave can actually become nonlinear, meaning that the B over B becomes larger than one. So this happens at about 100 stellar radius for this particular case. Now, if you think of another uh, criterion, so if the energy involved in this oven wave packet actually becomes larger than the uh, total energy in the magnetosphere beyond some certain radius, then the oven wave can actually break out from that radius. This is what we see in this simulation. Uh, what I'm going to show you now is that we launch an oven wave by uh, twisting this circular region back and forth uh, on the magnetar surface. And then this launches an alpha wave. So in the movie, you will see these uh, colors represent the toroidal magnetic field in the alpha wave. So this is a 2D axis symmetric simulation. So these alpha waves initially propagate along the magnetic field lines. And then at this point, they become nonlinear. What happens is that the wave packet basically just moves ballistically outward, uh, pushing open these field lines. So this produces basically a, a closed field loop that moves out along with this uh, alpha wave packet. So this basically ejects the amount of magnetic energy contained in the wave packet and uh, it gets ejected outward So, so this simulation is carried out 
uh, in the force free regime, basically assume, we assume that uh, in the magnetosphere of the magnetar, the magnetic energy is much uh, larger than the plasma kinetic energy and pressure. So the evolution of the plasma is basically just governed by the Lorentz force. And this is basically the evolution equations here we need to satisfy the Maxwell equations and the force free condition, meaning that the Lorentz force needs to balance out itself, determines the current in the plasma. So this could be a good approximation uh, in the magnetar surrounding because the magnetic field is so strong. Uh, here we basically use our GPU accelerated force free code coffee to do these simulations. Uh, let's take another look at on larger scales, how the ejecta behaves. So in this movie, I'm going to show you the left panel shows the energy density in the electromagnetic field. And the right panel shows the, uh, basically the plasma Lorentz factor. So uh, you can see that the often wave packet as it breaks out, it basically carries almost all the energy with it. And this energy becomes much larger than the background uh, magnetic energy density. Uh, here we eject another often wave packet to mimic the multiple ejection event that's probably happening in this galactic magnetar uh, fast radio burst case. So, and on this panel, you can also see that uh, as the ejector moves outward, actually the Lorentz factor is increasing. So basically this blob of plasma is being accelerated by all this magnetic uh, tension behind it. So it's reaching higher and higher Lorentz factor. So this could eventually launch shocks in the uh, magnetar wind. Um, so we- uh, Hi, yeah, I'm sorry, this is uh -huh. beautiful stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. But just a quick question. One issue with force free is uh, you're very well aware, I'm sure, is is that it doesn't prevent uh, the electric field from becoming uh, larger than the magnetic field. And, right. right. Um, of course, in pulsar simulations, uh, this is was first seen near the um, in the equatorial current sheet. Um, right. But in this case, it's more like a perpendicular uh, electric and magnetic field in this wave. I mean, do you find that this is an issue numerically? So indeed, in the code, there are regions where the force-free uh, condition will be violated, uh, especially at the location where we uh, actually see the uh, a current sheet formation. Uh, especially here, you can see here, there's a current sheet. Mm -hmm. uh, there are uh, reconnection going on. So, so this reconnection is caused basically by numerical resistivity in our code. So in our code, we do limit the E to be less than B and uh, limit uh, E parallel to be zero. So, so this kind of like um, yeah. enforcing the force-free condition. So it basically removes some energy from the system. But what about the wave pulse itself? So the, the wave pulse itself, this part yeah. seems to be- Maybe I should talk okay. to you after the talk. It's just that I wrote okay. a paper arguing that in a different context, you could actually have E larger than B, even in the wave pulse. But I think I, this would distract the conversation. So I'll stop. Yeah. Thanks, thanks. Yeah, uh, uh, we can talk about that later. Uh, right, okay. So, so here um, we think that, uh, the fast radio burst could be produced by the asynchrotron maser process at the shock that is eventually launched when the ejecta run into the uh, magnetic wind and the surrounding medium. So uh, here, basically the synchrotron maser is that uh, you have this upstream cold plasma that run into a compressed magnetic field. So all the particles starts to gyrate in, uh, in the same phase. So they emit coherently uh, in radio. So we find that the radio burst uh, could have an energy that is uh, consistent with the observed one about 10 to 36 Earths. And the radio emission uh, comes from a radius at about 10 to 13 centimeter. So uh, how about the X-ray emission? Uh, because for this magnetar, uh, 
fast reading burst, there's also a co uh, coincident X-ray burst. So we think that in this kind of scenario, there's a natural uh, site that produce the X-ray emission. Uh, this is the magnetic reconnection behind the ejecta. So, uh, so in our simulation, we see that as the alpha wave packet pushes open the magnetic field lines. So here in this region, you will have uh, opposite polarity field lines meet on the equatorial plane. And this is basically uh, a current sheet and you can see it in the current density as well. So uh, this is very strong current. So this configuration is quite unstable where the opposite magnetic field lines can actually exchange partners and release the energy stored in these stretched field lines. So this is basically the magnetic reconnection process. So these field lines are basically uh, overstretched and they reconnect and release that energy. So this energy can go into heating the plasma and producing the X-ray emission. You can also see that the current sheet extends all the way into the uh, southern end of this uh, wave uh, packet here. So this part actually moves relativistically with the, plas uh, with the plasmoid ejection and it could produce beamed X-ray emission. So here we used this numerically dissipated energy as a proxy to calculate the observed X-ray light curves. So basically we indeed see this very beamed emission. Uh, this is a sky map. Uh, the, this is the observer time and this is the uh, theta angle with respect to the magnetic axis. And if you cut with this white line at a particular observer angle, this is the light curve we would see. Uh, so this beam the emission comes exactly from this uh, current sheet that's moving relativistically with the ejecta. So because of the relativistic effect, the emission that comes from, that, that actually comes from different radius will all be piled up. And you see these uh, very sharp spikes. Uh, we think this is a very nice way that probably is uh, really reproducing what we observe from the X-ray light curves. So the simulations I showed you just now is a 2D axisymmetric simulation. But in reality, the quick disturbance on the neutron star surface is probably not really a ring. A more realistic situation is that we probably only have this disturbance uh, over a very small uh, region on the style surface. So uh, can this also produce a ejecta? Uh, the answer is yes. So we carried out this 3D simulation where we instead twist this circular uh, small region on the stellar surface. So this will again launch an alpha wave uh, into the magnetosphere. So this is how the simulation looks like. The green lines are field lines and this color is the uh, energy density of the fields. So you can see that the wave that propagates along the field lines also becomes nonlinear and they become a, a plasmoid that moves out, uh, ejected, gets ejected from the magnetosphere. So indeed in 3D uh, with this, only a small disturbed region on the stellar surface, we can also have this kind of ejecta. Uh, here, in fact, the energy requirement is uh, relatively smaller compared to 2D case, because uh, in 2D case, you need to open the whole ring of the magnetic field. But in the, this 3D case, we only open a portion of the magnetosphere and it actually requires a less amount of energy. So uh, this is a, just a slice on the plan that cuts symmetrically through this often wave packet. You can see these features very similar to our 2D simulation. So this is the ejecta and there is, is a current sheet formation here and a lot of reconnection is happening in these current sheets. So the 2D picture seems to be quite robust actually. Uh, just a few more nice figures about how the structure of the ejecta looks like. So these are the magnetic fields uh, in the ejecta, and this is the angular distribution of the energy density. So we can see that most of the energy is 
concentrated in this relatively small angular range, not more than about 0.5 in star, uh, star radian. So the, the energy distribution in the ejecta is relatively, relatively compact. Uh, and, and in this 3D case, there is very interesting uh, current distribution behind the ejecta with uh, a lot of dissipation going on. So here we can also see these equatorial current sheets. That's basically where the different polarity field lines in the two hemispheres uh, of the magnetar meets. So you can see that in this region, the current sheet breaks down into these kind of uh, uh, filaments. So these are basically produced by this uh, unstable tearing mode in the current sheet that produce these uh, small plasmoids. Uh, so this can be a efficient dissipation process that heats up the plasma. Cool, so in this 3D simulation, uh, we are able to better characterize the angular distribution of the radio and X-ray emissions respectively. So that's some analysis we are carrying out right now. So hopefully uh, we will get a better uh, idea about what the kind of emission we would expect. So another kind of scenario uh, related to this uh, fast radio burst is that uh, there are some proposals that the uh, radio burst may be produced from the inner magnetosphere. Uh, so we think this is also very interesting and particularly, there's a scenario proposed by Wen Bingdu and others. Uh, it's also involving alpha waves, but in a different kind of context. So what they propose is that because alpha waves need current to support its propagation. So when the alpha wave propagates out, if the density of the plasma uh, decreases very rapidly, then the alpha wave may run into a regime where the surrounding plasma cannot provide enough uh, charge carriers to conduct the current in the alpha wave. So they call it uh, the charge starved alpha waves. So these alpha waves, because of the charge starvation, they think that uh, there will be induced electric field that can uh, accelerate particles to very high energies. And then these accelerated particles give coherent curvature radiation to produce the radio burst. So we are very curious whether this kind of uh, process can work. Uh, so, so we carry with a few collaborators. So here I wanted to mention that to reach this kind of uh, alpha wave uh, to uh, charge starvation, there are two possibilities. One, of course, as mentioned by Wen Binglu and others, is that the, if the charge density in the magnetosphere decreases with radius fast enough, then you could reach this kind of charge starvation. Another possibility we find from our simulation is that uh, when the alpha wave propagates out along these dipole field lines, their wave run can become sheared because uh, the wave speed along the field lines is always C, but the field line have different lengths. So the inner ones are shorter and the wave front will uh, reach a further uh, stage than the ones propagating on outer field lines. So the wave front gets uh, strongly sheared as they go out to the southern hemisphere. So this leads to increased k perp. Uh, the perpendicular wave vector in the alpha wave, because the current in the alpha wave basically depends on the perpendicular wave vector. So when this k perp increase uh, due to this propagation effect, this also leads to the current needed in the alpha wave becomes uh, more and more stronger. So this can also lead to the results where the current in the alpha wave is larger than the surrounding plasma can provide. So the, both the two kind of channels to reach charge starvation would give you the same kind of situation where alpha wave current becomes larger than the plasma surrounding can provide. So what will happen in this case? 
So my collaborators, Alex Chen and others, carried out these fully self-consistent particle in cell plasma simulations. Basically, it models both the evolution of the electromagnetic field and the plasma uh, distribution self-consistently. What we did here is that we have these background magnetic field lines showing as these green lines. And we launch an alpha wave. Uh, you can see here, this color shows the magnetic field in the alpha wave. So this alpha wave will run into a medium with decreasing uh, density. So at this point, the alpha wave uh, will have a current that is larger than that can be supported by the surrounding plasma medium. So what will happen to this alpha wave? Uh, as you will see here, so as the alpha wave propagates out, it turns out that uh, when it runs into this low density region, the alpha wave uh, will sweep up the plasma and carry the plasma with it. So there only need to be a very small parallel electric field, uh, parallel meaning parallel to the background magnetic field. So only a small electric field can accelerate the particles and then the particles will be able to move together with the alpha wave. Basically, plasma is being advected by these alpha waves. You can see here this high density region is basically the plasma that is being advected by this alpha wave packet. So it turns out that the alpha waves are fine propagating into this low density region. They will just carry the plasma with them uh, and this plasma will be able to support the current in the alpha waves. And there need not to be a very large electric field to accelerate, uh, to accelerate the plasma. So we measured this electric field uh, induced in these alpha waves. Uh, it turns out that this electric field uh, is really small and the dissipation rate as calculated here is um, orders of magnitude small compared to the fast radio burst from this galactic magnet heart. So we think that this process is probably not energetically enough. Um, although more detailed study of the detailed emission process need to be carried out uh, to see whether such kind of uh, process can really produce radio emission. A quick question. Mm -hmm. um, so of course, one way to get charged starvation, which is I think quite robust, is to cascade because uh, the I current see. density increases during the cascade. And so I've you know, looked at this in the case of a strong magnetic field in a few papers. And um, I just had a question then about the previous calculation you were showing with the bouncing Alfane wave, because uh, it looked like you were almost getting to the point where the wave could yeah. collide with itself, that you know it would bounce off the star and then, and then the, the the wave would interact with itself. And um, um, is there much self interaction taking place during during that bouncing phase? Um, Reflection phase. Yeah, uh, that's a good question. So so here it's it's not obvious because it's it's basically like the the different parts along neighboring field lines evolve a bit differently. So so like okay. the the wave on the inner field lines uh, is reflected first, and then, then it's, yeah, the, there is, I think that the interaction is probably small here, but when, when the wave is stretched really long, I think it, it could be more significant. Yeah, that, that's a good point. We, we didn't really look into the interaction at this moment. It'll depend, of course, in the given simulation on the amplitude that you're, you're putting in, but. Uh... Right, right. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, okay, so I have talked about two effects so far. One is the nonlinear breakout of the alpha wave, and the other is uh, possible charge starvation of the alpha wave. Uh, now I want to mention a third effect uh, that could happen to these alpha waves uh, is that the alpha wave may convert to a different wave mode called the fast magnetosonic waves. 
Mm -hmm. uh, this uh, study is actually motivated by the uh, recently observed glitch from the Vela pulsar. Uh, so Vela pulsar is known to produce uh, glitches where the uh, spin uh, period of the pulsar changes suddenly. Uh, so the remarkable thing is that recently uh, Paul Freeman and his collaborators basically used a few small radio telescopes to monitor Vela continuously. So actually they caught a glitch of the Vela pulsar in real time. So they measured uh, each single pulse during the glitch event. So here is shown this glitch, uh, these pulses uh, happen during this glitch. So the interesting thing is that uh, coincident with this glitch, there's one very broad pulse, uh, this one, uh, it's, it's very different from the previous pulses. And then the next one is completely gone, it's in now. And then after this one, the pulse came back and it's more or less uh, recovered. So this is a very interesting case where the glitch actually modified the radio emission of the pulsar. So it's very likely that the glitch actually changed the structure of the radio emission region in the pulsar magnetosphere. So one picture um, proposed by Ashley Bransgrove uh, and collaborators is that uh, it may be possible that this glitch is triggered by a quake and the star quake launches often waves into the magnetosphere. So as the often wave propagates in the magnetosphere, it can lead to enhanced current in some regions, for example, like uh, shown here. Uh, these regions where the often wave basically requires a lot more current to conduct uh, itself. This will lead to more pair production in the magnetosphere. So the pair production can modify the radio emission process. But the good question here is that because the radio pulse is only modified for two uh, rotation periods, afterwards the radio pulse uh, becomes normal again. So the the often wave that affect the radio emission should have a short lifetime. So it not, should not uh, last for more than two rotation periods. So the question is, uh, what is the lifetime of these often waves? Uh, can, can they really uh, be, be uh, dissipated within this just two rotational period? So there are a few channels for often waves to lose energy. Uh, for example, there is this counter-propagating often waves leading to turbulence cascade. So this has been studied by uh, Xin Yu Li uh, and also recently by uh, Tenbaj and Riperda et al. And also the often waves can be absorbed by the crust. Uh, that way often wave also loses energy. Uh, and we mentioned that this shearing of the wave front uh, may lead to uh, power production and that dissipates some energy too. Uh, one more process for often wave to lose energy is conversion to fast magnetosonic waves. So this process hasn't been studied much before. So that's what we are going to focus on right now. So what I'm going to show you is uh, still uh, force-free simulations of this often wave evolution, because this effect is actually purely a fluid level effect. So in the force-free electrodynamics, basically there are two wave modes. One is the often wave, so often wave basically propagates along the magnetic field lines with a group speed uh, of C along the magnetic field line. And there's also this fast magnetosonic wave. Uh, it's basically just like an electromagnetic wave uh, with speed C. Um, so this is the fast magnetosonic wave in the uh, infinite magnetization limit, basically. So I'm just going to show you uh, examples of how this mode conversion can happen. So what we do here is, again, similar to before, where we launch often waves uh, by twisting this ring uh, on the neutron star surface. So these often waves have much lower, 
uh, amplitude than the previous one I showed where it breaks out. So these alpha wave will basically just uh, propagate nicely in the magnetosphere. So on the left panel, this shows the toroidal magnetic field associated with the alpha wave. On the right panel, this shows the toroidal electric field. So for alpha wave, for pure alpha wave, there should not be toroidal electric field here. So this toroidal electric field is actually associated with the fast uh, wave. So you can see that the alpha wave basically propagates along the magnetic field line, but this fast wave uh, is not confined to field lines. It basically goes out more or less spherically. So we measured the energy in the fast wave. So you can see here, there is an increase in the fast wave energy, and there is a few other increases as the alpha wave bounces back and forth in the magnetosphere. So we wanted to measure how this conversion efficiency depends on the amplitude of the alpha wave and how far away the alpha wave propagates in the magnetosphere. So this is the measurement we carried out. So here, these dots show different conversion efficiency uh, with a different initial alpha wave amplitude. So this axis is basically the amplitude of the alpha waves. And the red and blue points are actually corresponding to alpha waves launched on two different field lines. So the blue one, the field line reaches further away in the magnetosphere. In fact, if we do not uh, plot against the initial amplitude of the alpha wave, but instead uh, we plot the conversion efficiency as a function of the amplitude of the alpha wave as it reaches the equatorial uh, plane, we find that all these points fall on this same trend. It's basically the conversion efficiency grows with this amplitude as a quadratic relation. So this result is basically consistent with this kind of nonlinear three-wave interaction. Basically what happens is that as the alpha wave propagates along the dipole magnetic field lines, because it's a curved magnetic field line, it generates a backward propagating alpha wave and an outward going fast wave. So this kind of three-wave interaction give us this quadratic relation of conversion efficiency into the fast wave uh, as a function of the amplitude of the alpha wave. Now this looks uh, good. It's like consistent with the theory of three-wave interactions. But another interesting thing we find is that uh, previously the experiment was carried out in a non-rotating magnetosphere. Now, how about if we look at a rotating magnetosphere? Now this is how the magnetosphere looks like when the, magnetar, uh, when the neutron star is rotating. So you have the light cylinder here. So the closed field line only extends up to the light cylinder and the field lines that go through the light cylinder will all be opened up. So we still launch alpha waves in this closed region. Uh, what happens here, uh, you will see a bit similar to previously, the alpha wave goes along the field lines and it produces this fast wave that goes out uh, regardless of the background field. So here, the interesting thing is that we find in this rotating case, the conversion efficiency behaves quite differently. Uh, so the conversion efficiency actually reaches a constant value uh, at small uh, amplitude of the alpha waves. So this indicates a linear relation of conversion from alpha wave to fast wave. So previously, uh, in a non-rotating magnetosphere, you basically have an alpha wave generating a backward propagating alpha wave and an outgoing fast wave. So it's a second order process, but here it's a linear process. Basically, I think what happens here is that because of this rotation of the background magnetosphere, there is an electric field induced by the rotation of the magnetosphere. So this electric field is actually uh, non-uniform. And as the wave propagates in this non-uniform rotating electric field, it interacts with this electric field 
and generate the fast wave directly. So this becomes a linear conversion process. So it turns out that the oven wave may convert to fast mode uh, most significantly if the wave reach relatively large amplitude and also if the wave propagates relatively close to the uh, separatrix where, where the field line actually extends very close to the light cylinder because there the rotation effect is the most significant. Uh, however, the conversion will become less efficient when the oven wave has been uh, increasingly sheared because when this k-probe increases, the coupling between the oven wave and fast wave become uh, less efficient um, because this is uh, basically a resonant process. The oven wave dispersion relation depends on the k parallel to the magnetic field, but the fast wave dispersion relation depends on the total k. So when this k probe increases, it's harder for the waves to satisfy the resonant condition. So the interaction will drop. Well, um, just a, a quick, before you get onto the phenomenology, um, you know, there's a related effect uh, uh -huh. that has been studied, actually a student of mine studied, um, involving the propagation of an alphane wave, not on a curved magnetic field line, but in a gravitational field. I see. And uh, in an inhomogeneous gravitational field, uh, the propagation speed of the alphane wave uh, depends on the, you know, the lapse function, et cetera. And so it's different on different field lines. Mm -hmm. And so what we found was that um, you could create a fast wave, which I think, as I recall, it's a, it was it's a long time, it was pub, is, is, goes quadratically with the uh, um, alphane wave due to the cr creation of a force imbalance transverse to the field. So it's very much the same effect. Um, where it's not the curvature of the field that's causing the difference in propagation speed, uh, you know, but effectively, but the difference in the length of the field line, right? But, but, but we didn't think about this in terms of a resonant effect. It was simply a difference in path length, creating oh. a, a, a force imbalance because, you know, the mode you're putting in, you know, basically assumes a certain structure for the magnetic field. And, and if you, you know, so but by, by changing that structure, you, you essentially create an imbalance in the mode directly. I see. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, it's probably a related uh, phenomenon as well. Yeah, I would be happy to look into that case as well. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, so now if we apply the previous scaling relations to the Vila pulsar, um, for example, uh, Imagine like the often wave has a typical frequency about 10 to four uh, hertz and the wavelength is about a few stellar radius. Uh, and if uh, it's, it's a bit unclear what is the magnitude of the often wave, but if we take uh, energy flux about 10 to 26 org per second and uh, uh, the often wave amplitude would be about 10 to the minus four, then we find that the conversion efficiency to the fast wave can be reached uh, most significantly on the field lines that extends uh, to a radius greater than uh, half the light cylinder radius. So these, on these field lines, the often wave, uh, maybe about 20% of its energy can be converted to fast wave. Uh, however, after the often wave bounces uh, back from the cell surface, the conversion efficiency will drop. So, uh, so what's going to happen is very likely that initially there may be about 20% or so energy gets into the fast wave, but the remaining energy of the often wave uh, has to be dissipated through other channels. Okay. So um, I think I will now uh, sum up uh, this talk. So I basically mentioned a few different effects uh, that often waves can have as they propagate in the magnetosphere of neutron stars. They could have this nonlinear breakout, and this may be re related to the uh, X-ray burst and fast radio burst from the galactic magnetar. And the often wave may have uh, this charge starvation effect, but we think the energetics 
is probably not enough to explain the fast radio bursts. And for this other case where you have small amplitude often waves propagating in these dipole field lines, they could convert to fast mode. And this could be a uh, important channel for the energy loss. So uh, I think I will end here and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you, Yajin. Um, let's give a round of applause. Thanks. And uh, if anyone has any questions. Well, I was wondering, I'm sorry, I, because of another meeting, I had to miss the first five minutes of your talk. May, so maybe you said something about this, but could you say a bit more about the code you've developed? Because uh, this was with Chen in, in part, wasn't it? Um, uh, what was involved in that? Oh, so, so this code is uh, basically, um, we, we have a, Uh, it's basically a just a uh, like a um, finite difference code. Uh, so so basically, we have a fourth order scheme uh, in both like spatial discretization and time integration, and uh, the there are a few important things related to where the force free condition might break down. So what we do here is that uh, we basically uh, first limit the electric field to be less than the magnetic field. So if electric field becomes larger than B, we just uh, cut away the electric field uh, to, to, to uh, make it to be less than B. And another condition is E dot B has to be constrained to be uh, zero. So if there is somewhere E dot B becomes non zero, we also cut the electric field to make it uh, to be perpendicular to the magnetic field. Uh, a third thing that happens is that we have this uh, Christ Oliger dissipation. Uh, it's basically a uh, higher order filtering uh, scheme that basically removes the higher order noise. So this is kind of like a uh, numerical. Uh, dissipation term that is in the code. So, so, so these kind of non-ideal effects uh, would allow somewhere when the current sheet develops, it can have reconnection. So what has been done? I mean, um, you know, a significant part of the challenge is in this um, uh, fairly complicated expression for the current in terms of the fields. Mm -hmm. um, and so what has been done, for example, well, I mean, it's hard to think of sort of, 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 of you know, I'm not, I've never built a, something like an MHG code my, myself, but, you know, when you're building an MHG code, there are all sorts of standard tests one can perform, you know, shock tests, shock tube tests, and so on. Uh, oh, I see. Um, uh, and are there related sort of tests one can do that to, check out the behavior of this, um, um, you know, this, the, uh, how it handles the nonlinearities? Oh, that's a good question. So, so recently, yeah, I, I have some collaborators who have been carrying out this uh, convergence test for this force free code. And I also mm -hmm. carried out uh, some convergence test for, for our code recently. It's still some work in progress. Uh, so um, it's possible to do the test on a, for example, on a often wave to see like how much numerical dissipation you have. And also another test is like a current sheet that has pairing mode. Uh, so so, so that, that's also a test, especially on this kind of uh, force-free validation conditions uh, you put in the code. So, so these tests, I, I have seen some of my colleagues uh, do this kind of test. And I, I did this a bit myself. Well, and there it, is a little bit of um, something I, I, we, we don't fully understand yet, uh, especially re related to this cutting of the electric field. It leads to uh, the convergence order of the code to be less compared to the expected 
discretization. Well, in, 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 in particular, um, and I know this is something that goes back, you know, certainly to people like Spekovsky, um, you know, there, there are issues about how the structure in the magnetic field, these O and X points you're producing uh, um, near a, uh, the, say, the equatorial current sheet matches up with what you might get out of a direct sort of PEC type simulation. And has there been a sort of a detailed, when you were indicating that there has, there has been some effort to cross compare with say a you know, kinetic or a PEC uh, calculation um, as, to, as to exactly say how, how the reconnection happens? Yeah, I, I should say that in, in force free, uh, it's, it's a bit artificial, this kind of reconnection. So, yeah. So it's it's hard to directly uh, one on one compare to the peak simulations because in peak it, it's basically collision list and you have other effects especially at the current sheet it's probably the uh, pressure uh, gradient that supports the electric field there instead of uh, so called numerical resistivity or uh, mm -hmm. uh, physical resistivity so so I I have been talking with some people here who who do this kind of simulations, but the, the, the conclusions is that um, it, it may be a bit hard to do the direct comparison. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, sorry, I mean to cut you off. I just, I noticed that JJ also put his hand up. I don't know if you have a question. Yeah, thank you very much for a really nice talk. Um, so I think my question is gonna be a lot more naive than uh, Chris's. Um, so I was just wondering, in terms of physics, when you have an initial magnetic field perturbation near the neutron star surface, what is the reason that the magnetic field perturbation grows as the wave propagates outward um, through the neutron star spectrosphere? Oh, so, so here is only like the uh, relative amplitude growth. So, so in fact, the magnetic field uh, still decays. It's just that it decays slower than the background magnetic field. Yeah, background field decays as one of R cubed, but the wave uh, magnetic field decays as one of R to the three halves. So, so the relative amplitude becomes large, uh, but the yeah the energy in the wave is conserved. Uh, so it's a it's a energy conservation that uh, determines the amplitude. Magnitude, yeah. As it, as yeah, exactly, exactly. It's the energy conservation and also the flux conservation as you, okay. it's confined to these flux ah, tubes. Okay, okay, yeah. okay. So, so it's like a, a WKB packet that's- uh, Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. yeah, this is the WKB estimation. It doesn't take into <laughs> account the nonlinear okay. effects yet. Yeah. Okay, okay. And then, yeah, yeah. one very, sorry, uh, follow-up question. So you, you said the magnetic field strength decays like one over R to the minus three, does that, assume a dipole magnetic field? Because I thought you also said that this right. is force-free, right? So are you, uh, does that, does a force-free magnetosphere change the one over R to the minus three dependence at all? Yeah, good good point. So I think the the the, the, the field is still largely dipole uh, near the star. So, so only when you get relatively close to the light signature, probably it's modified. Uh, so for for the, for the magnetar because they are slowly rotating, uh, their period is probably a few seconds or so. Then the light center is pretty far away. So we think, for example, this breakout radius here is probably still well within the light cylinder uh, of the neutron star. Yeah. Thanks. Um, I also see that uh, Shinyu and Yados have questions. Uh, I guess Shinyu, do you want to? Ask, ask. Uh, yeah. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Hey, hi, Yajin. Yeah. Yeah, I just have a question about this uh, for the conversion to the fast wave. What, what would be the relation between the wavelengths of the alpha wave and the fast loads? I mean, if it is the three wave interaction you are saying uh, for the alpha wave interact with the background dipole, I, I guess you should probably expect the wavelengths to be similar. Is that right? Or uh, yeah, it's it's kind of similar. Um, in this case, it seems like, yeah, I I think it, it's quite similar. Yeah, if you look at 
this case here. So, so this is one wavelength here. It seems there are like so two that, wavelengths. Uh, so in this case, there's not much like a cascade to smaller wavelength stuff. It's a bit similar. Okay, I see. Sure, thanks. Yeah. And uh, Janos, do you still have a question? Uh, yeah, I just had a, also a naive question. Uh, the, from the videos, very tall, by the way. Thank you. Um, the, the videos. Sorry, did, did my connection? <laughs> like, uh, did yeah, I, I think also it? your audio cut out a little bit. Sorry, my. Uh, can I'm sorry, my, my mic has been cut. Kind of, may may not work here. I, I can ask. A uh, yeah, if you want, you can ask in a maybe a text question or. Uh, so, uh, yeah, Jay, are you able to see his chat question that he just posted, or I can I can read it if not? Oh, I I think I can see the question. So, okay. did did the simulations show and demonstrate the reduction of the plasma OFC exclude coverage defense? Oh, this, oh, that's that's a good question. Yeah, indeed, here we we didn't include the coverage of the field lines. Uh, so these are just straight field lines. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. Like whether the curvature would change the direction. I think that's something we, we, we should look into. Yeah, yeah, good point. Thanks. Okay. Um, thank you, everyone, for your questions. I, I don't think there are any more questions. Uh, so in that case, let's give another round of applause for our speaker. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for coming. Well, I, well at this point, I, I, if you want, I could just uh, 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 elaborate a little bit on the, a, a, a couple of issues that we were briefly discussing in your talk. Sure, uh, sure. That I didn't want to, you know, uh, distract you. Um, one of them has to do with um, this issue of, of breakdown of force free. And I realized after you started talking about the fast modes, that what I'd published really had more to do with the fast mode than the alpha anyway. So my question about the about possible e bigger than b in the wave structure actually really was more applicable to the fast wave than to the alpha anyway. So if, I, if you want, I could share um, oh, my, my screen and I'll, I'll show you just the paper I was involved in uh, with Louis Lehner and, and collaborators and. Um, you know, my, my contribution was 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 limited not to the numerics at all, but just to the discussion of this issue of E bigger than B. And there was a little similarity solution I put together. And so I think I could just show you a figure from that and um, and it would be clearer than trying to describe it. Um, so um,
Okay, so you can see this this uh, intense oh, electromagnetic yeah. outbursts thing. Okay, right. So, um, uh, so this was you know a, a force free calculation of the collapse of a neutron star to a black hole in numerical relativity. I see. Um, so the I think it's fair to say that the uh, E and M part of the calculation didn't have the um, fidelity that is in your calculations, but it did have full dynamical space time. Anyway, um, and so part of this has to do with, you know, how does the magnetic field remove itself from the neutron star? Hmm. Um, but then um, somewhere now, here we go. Okay. So um, you can put together uh, uh, a, a self-similar model of a point, basically a point dipole. Hmm. And the dipole is collapsing, right? And so if you conserve magnetic flux, oh, I see. right? You think mm -hmm. about it. If you conserve magnetic flux right. in the star and you mm -hmm. shrink the radius, the magnetic dipole moment goes down, right? Oh, the magnetic dipole moment goes as the flux times the radius. So oh, what that means right. is that as the star shrinks, there's an outgoing, you know, um, what in hydrodynamics would be called an expansion wave, but are basically an outgoing electromagnetic wave. But this wave mm -hmm. has the electric vector in the toroidal direction, just like the fast wave. And of course it is sort of a fast-like wave because you're dealing with the compression mm -hmm. of the magnetic field, right? Right. right. And so in, the, in this panel here um, on the right, uh, mm -hmm. you can see, uh, oh dear, what am I doing? It's not moving. Zoom slows things down. There we go. Okay. So at, uh, I think this is a two successive times, but you see in the equatorial zone, mm -hmm. there are these, uh, these are the field lines, the magnetic field lines. And you see that mm -hmm. there's this, um, you know, this, this, this sort of shock-like structure that forms. Oh. And, and then near the equator, um, this is the zone where E is bigger than B. Okay, so if you think about it, it's oh. very simple. If I have an outgoing electromagnetic wave, right? Mm -hmm. And the wave has the electric vector in the toroidal direction, then that means that in spherical coordinates, the um, magnetic vector of the wave has to be in the theta direction, right? Right. And so that wave magnetic field can either add constructively or destructively with the dipole field. If it adds yeah, destructively, right. then, you get, then you get E bigger than B. And so that's what's happening here. So I was noticing in your fast wave calculation where the fast wave was escaping, a little piece of the fast wave seemed to be eaten away. It disappeared as it crossed the, after it crossed the Y point. And so oh. I, I, my, I, my question to you would be, have you checked in that case, and it's the fast wave, not the Alfane wave, uh -huh. uh, you know, what is happening to E and B, the relative magnitude of E and B? Well, that's an interesting question. Um... Yeah, I haven't really checked that. So, well, it's just something something to check. Um, I see. Yeah, but, well, you know, but what, I, what, I was curious that um, because in, in force free, it's it's a bit so 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 if you like um, just add two independent solution together, they, they may not really be a solution to the force free equations. So that there would be modifications. Uh, so I'm. Wondering if, if the, the fast wave would like, even if it will like uh, add destructively with the background field, it could compress the background field to, to make it to be like still uh, force free. Uh, I, I don't know if that's possible, but, but I, well, I was no. imagining. Um, uh... I think that the, the general question you raised there is, is uh, you know, of course, a very 